Well, this is uh, a presentation called, as you can see, The Effect of the Scientific Revolution on Philosophy. Most of what you have been considering up to this point have been causes of and descriptions of the scientific revolution. My presentation, I think Mr. Palvins as well, if I'm not mistaken, is looking more at what happened as a result, what were the effects of the scientific revolution, and so I'm looking more or less after the fact. I don't want you to misunderstand, so let me tell you up front that while I am a fan of the scientific revolution, I think it's one of God's great gifts to us in terms of our Western heritage and so on, I am not so much of a fan of the effects, and so this may strike you as a presentation which has a little bit of a negative uh, slant to it, because I think that while, as Paul says, we should use this world, we should be on our guard not to abuse this world, the statement he makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I think the scientific revolution certainly used this world rightly. I think, however, that maybe some of what took place afterwards became an abuse of this world, and so I will be kind of chasing that idea along. I'll also, uh, right up front, apologize to my philosophy students, some of whom are sitting here looking very, very impressive, and, uh, because this is all going to be absolutely pure, unmitigated review, repetition. So feel free to snore. It's okay. You can just kind of pass out. Uh, there we are. But uh, anyway. So those of you who will be taking philosophy from me someday, you'll cover some of this material in some greater detail than we're going to have right now. Let's, uh, let's pray and get started. Father, we're grateful to you for your many mercies to us. We thank you for the wonderful opportunities we've had to learn from this History Emphasis Week and thinking about the scientific revolution. We pray that our time together right now would be guided through your spirit, so that we would have clarity and understanding, and all of these things would be to the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, well, 100 years ago, when I went to college, I wanted to be a psychology major. And the reason for that was because I was interested in human beings. Even in high school, I'd sort of thought about, why do people do things? How come people are more, some people are more emotional than others? And how come some people seem to have more problems? And I, I actually had designs at the time of possibly becoming a counselor or a psychologist. And so I thought, well, what better way to get myself down the road toward that objective than to major in psychology? And so off I went. And after bouncing around a couple of other majors, wound out as a declared psych major. I was somewhat disappointed when early on in my studies of psychology, I found out that the prevailing paradigm for psychological theory at the time was more or less the result of the architecture of a guy by the name of B.F. Skinner, who was pictured here. Skinner was a professor of psychology at Harvard University. He was very highly respected. At the time, he's not so much in vogue these days, but nevertheless at the time, he was kind of a popular guy. And most of my psychological studies in college were oriented to a so-called Skinnerian approach. Skinner himself was connected to something called radical behaviorism. The heart of his paradigm for psychological understanding came to be called the Skinner Box, which I have now set before you. The Skinner box has a particular set of little apparatuses that are connected to it. And I'll just kind of mention these here briefly. You can see it there. There's a speaker, which gives certain sounds to this mouse. There are signal lights, red and blue. There's a little lever that the mouse would push. And upon pushing it, a food dispenser would send a little pellet of food down a tube into the box to reward whatever the behavior was of the mouse that the, the uh, experimenter was trying to reward. But you'll also notice more sinister aspects to this because there is an electric grid you see at the bottom. And then off on the uh, side is what's called a shock generator. I've actually been pr proposing that here at the Oaks we might want to start implementing some of these uh, as a new disciplinary, a kind of a shock generator beneath each chair in the room, you know. And so when a child begins to disobey a little bit, kind of acting up over here, I just beep, you know, and you got a little, you know, 100 volts or so, bang like that. You get great behavior, right? I, I'm, I'm rethinking my criticism of Skinner. But anyway, Skinner uh, was developing a hypothesis that 
A rat could be trained to a very sophisticated level of behavior. I mean, he could train these rats to roll over three times, count to ten, do calculus, and so on, all of which was to get a food pellet. It was really quite an astonishing thing. Little flashing lights and a certain sequence and so on, the, 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 the rats could learn all of this and became quite impressive in their ability to evaluate their, their uh, environment and do certain things as a result of it. And Skinner's belief was all of that was the product of what he called conditioning. We called it operant conditioning, in which certain behaviors would be rewarded systematically, others would be extinguished, and by virtue of kind of manipulating the environment using all these little devices, he could get uh, creatures to behave in a certain way. Well, he extrapolated from that that all of us are really simply sophisticated rats in much more sophisticated Skinner boxes. And the reason that any of you are sitting here in this room right now listening to this lecture, the reason that you behave the way you do, the reason that you act in any way that you do is strictly the product of the conditioning that has taken place in which certain of your behaviors have been rewarded and certain of them have been extinguished or punished over time and that you are therefore simply the net result of your conditioning. That there's nothing else that accounts for what you are than those forces that he called inputs that have produced the output of your behavior right now. At the time, I didn't find that that training and learning how to train a mouse was all, all, all that helpful, but uh, actually I used it quite a bit when I was uh, raising my kids. I found that it was quite effective. You know, so. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, it's the uh, most famous book that was written by B.F. Skinner was quite a sensation at the time. It was entitled Beyond Freedom and Dignity because, according to Skinner, those are nonsense terms. It is nonsensical to speak of human freedom. You are the net product of your conditioning. There's no freedom to it. Freedom implies some kind of choice you make wherein, as a matter of fact, you make no choices. You are simply programmed by those environmental factors that have produced you. But of course, if you have no freedom, then terms like dignity also begin to be fairly uh, meaningless terms. And all of this, of course, stood for a great idea of science more or less taking over entirely an understanding of what it is to be human. This is what I say, what I mean when I say uh, use this world but don't abuse it. In my view, this is an abuse of science, making it explain more than it's capable or competent to explain, and by so doing, ridding you of any idea of value, any idea of right and wrong, ethical truth, transcendent uh, value of any kind, and reducing you really just simply to a rat, you see. And that was really what was going on, and in some ways still going on in certain schools of uh, psychological thought. Well, this was inspired. In other words, B.F. Skinner didn't come up with this all on his own. He read a book, and the book was written earlier in this century by a guy named John Watson. And the man's name, or the name of the book that he wrote was Behaviorism. John Watson himself had been inspired to do his writing by reading the uh, production of a guy by the name of John Dewey. Now, John Dewey's name you may recognize because John Dewey in some ways is regarded as the inventor of modern educational theory. We don't use his theories very much here at the Oaks, but most of the educational enterprise going on in America today is carried on in light of the uh, principles that were set forth by John Dewey, who was a signatory to the Humanist Manifesto. He was an atheist, he was an evolutionist, and he was committed to a certain way of doing education that really gave rise to this whole behavioristic understanding. He, Dewey, was generally, he acknowledged many times, influenced by the philosopher Georg, sometimes pronounced George, Hegel. And George Hegel gave us what's called a dialectical approach to philosophy and to education. And so that's kind of the chain that connects Skinner back into philosophical ideas. And so I'd like to have you think about Hegel and kind of as sort of a centerpiece of our discussion right now. But really to get to Hegel, we need to go to an earlier time. This is Hegel. And Hegel gave us this dialectical approach. He was attempting to fundamentally change the way in which we do philosophy. And he was consciously trying to marry science with philosophy. He comes right after the Enlightenment, and he's attempting in some ways 
to bring what he thought were the great advances of the Enlightenment into a philosophical system and produce then what has subsequently become modern philosophy. Well, how do you do that? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So, the uh, philosophy and the scientific revolution. In order to really understand it, we need to go, great, go way back to what I'm calling the grand distinction of classic philosophy. And the best way to symbolize this is to simply put a horizontal line on the screen. This is not a timeline. This is the line that you saw with Mr. Dowers a couple of days ago. It's rather a distinction between two levels of truth or two levels of human knowledge. One level could be called physical reality. It could be called the, the uh, level of nature or the level of what is. So this is what we commonly think of as the interest area of science. Now, on the other hand, above this line, you have what is commonly called, traditionally called, metaphysical reality. Aristotle himself is the one that coined that term, and he simply meant those things that are beyond the physical world. There is a level of truth, he thought, that is not immediately recognizable or discernible by simple, you know, human uh, natural observation. But this would be the level of things like supernature and the question about what is... Uh, what ought to be. So I could say on the one hand, here you are in this room, that is what is. Then I could raise the question, is this what ought to be? Should you be in this room? It's a very different question, isn't it? Let's see. It's one thing to note you are here, it's another thing to pass judgment on the significance of you being here in terms of the category of ought. Ought you be here, you see. One appeals to this level of physical observation, the other appeals to a higher level that kind of stands in judgment, in some sense, over the physical level. To use terms that you may be familiar with as well, you'd have terms like, this is just the good, the true, and the beautiful. These would all be ideas that are above the line, that are not necessarily things that you would simply derive from an observation of reality itself or in the natural order. All right, so this great debate of classic philosophy is symbolized by two characters. All right, this is the first answer. This is uh, the upward path that would be found in Plato. This is from Raphael's famous painting, The Academy, and of course his little cameo of Plato, of Plato here shows the one finger pointing up, right? And that finger pointing up is supposed to stand for Plato's notion that the way that we discover this world of metaphysical truth is what could be called the upward path or the world of pure reason, of simply exercising the mind and so on. And then we have answer number two. There we are. And this is uh, Aristotle. So Aristotle, you notice the difference between these two guys. You have Plato, who has his finger pointing up, standing for a notion that the way we discover this level above the line, the way we discover it, is by a sort of rational or intuitive inward path. The way Aristotle thought we discovered it was more an empirical or natural or scientific path, and thus he has four fingers pointing out, meaning pointing out to the world as a place that we should explore. Both of them said that we can, by this means, discover uh, the metaphysical level. They both believed in it. They just had differences of opinion as to how we were best to go about exploring it. Alright, so these are the great debaters of uh, classic philosophy. This is Plato and Aristotle. This is a little kind of uh, vignette, as you know, from Raphael's Academy. And, uh, so Plato's rationalism stands for the pursuit of truth follows this path of pure reason and intuition. Aristotle's path, there we are, follows a path of science and observation. So you've got that before you. And taken together, these two represent sort of this great, uh, in some ways, the very kind of uh, framework for philosophical thought from that point on. In the Middle Ages, the guy that you think of is sort of the first great thinker of the Middle Ages, the last of the Church Fathers is Augustine. Augustine made wonderful contributions to Christian understanding, as you're well aware, but he was dominated very much by a Platonic outlook. And thus, the Middle Ages, which tended to be heavily influenced by 
Augustine and his Platonism tended to have certain features to it that you're probably well aware of. Now, what you find is that the art, the music, the architecture, and so on, all the artistic expressions and much of the theological expression of the Middle Ages focused on truth as otherworldly. Not so much interest in this world, not so much interest in natural science and so on. They were following a platonic approach to truth. So the imagery that you run into, like this, I'm going to tell you something you probably can discern. I did not take that picture on the streets of Spokane using my digital camera. I didn't just stop a couple of people and snap a photo of them. And you can tell that immediately, can't you? You look at it and you say, oh, those people look weird. Now, I can show you a lot of weirder people, but you just look at it and you realize that's not exactly a natural portrayal of what people look like. Well, that was intentional. These weren't just bad artists. These were people trying to communicate through their art that the most important things are not in this world. And thus, we don't make art look like this world. The music, Gregorian chant, of course, has a kind of otherworldly sound to it, doesn't it? The architecture pointed your eye upward to the sky, saying that's what's most important. And thus you find the Middle Ages was dominated by this sort of platonic approach, which had that sort of otherworldly emphasis. Well, the Crusades changed everything, go ahead and hit it again, because in the Crusades we begin to see the door opened to the ancient classical age, which had a more humanistic flavor to it. And so the crusaders who went off to take back the Holy Land didn't succeed in that enterprise so well, but they did succeed in some things, namely bringing a whole lot of the, the uh, East, in some ways, back into Europe and making uh, Europe really feel the effects of a sort of change. All right, so let's talk about the Renaissance a little bit. Go ahead, Mr. The Renaissance, hit it again. Has, uh, I'm gonna, there's many ways we can talk about it. I'm going to, for purposes of simplicity, reduce this conversation to three main emphases, the one of which would be humanism. So humanism is symbolized many ways. I've chosen Leonardo da Vinci's famous little uh, Vitruvian man here, which represents his depiction of the idea of man as the measure of all proportion. There was also, of course, as a result of the Renaissance, an explosion of wealth. That wealth was reflected in many different ways at the time, but of course some of the great uh, Italian banking families are one of the best ways to illustrate that. The Medici and other banking families amassed vast fortunes in the imports that were brought back from the Crusades. My whole point here is to say that something changed as a result of the Crusades that led to this shift that we find in the Renaissance. You also find, however, at the same time, a fair amount of corruption because the rising wealth and the new interest on things human and a sort of loss of interest in great ideas of transcendent truth as such did produce some of the sort of practices that drove the uh, Reformation that would come later. This is a shot of jo Johann Tetzel, who of course was going out with papal authority to sell for money forgiveness of sins and such things, we would say that represents probably a lower level of theological truth that we would appreciate, and, and the entire thing led to a kind of corrupt system at the time. So the Reformation in some ways extends the Renaissance and in some ways responds to it, and so you find certain emphases in the Reformation, namely, for example, an emphasis on sources over tradition. This is NRK in Hologos, the first few words of the first uh, verse of the uh, Gospel of John. But my point is to say this. In the Reformation, it was no longer sufficient to rely on the authoritative Latin text or on dogmatic authoritarian statements as such. There was a desire, as uh, was stated uh, by uh, some of the Renaissance thinkers, to go ad fontes, back to the font, or back to the sources behind the authority, and begin our thinking there. There was another emphasis on conscience over authority. So, for example, Luther's famous speech, unless I'm convinced by proofs, unless I'm convinced by proofs from Scripture or by plain and clear reason, I will not recant. Notice how Luther is appealing to personal, individual persuasion and arguments that are reasonable. You see, again, this represents a little bit of the effect of the Renaissance, Erasmus would have said some of the same kinds of things.
and yet he's applying it uh, more or less in his Christian conviction. There was a emphasis on productive labor rather than slavish labor. So the, Re the Reformation was uh, famously committed to the dignity of human labor. There's a place and importance for labor, which earlier had been simply the domain of serfs and people that were at the lowest ends of the social scale and, you know, in some ways didn't matter that much. So now we have an entirely new dignity associated to things that are related to our individual lives. Human reason, human effort, human labor, personal production, and so on. And that, in some ways, extends the Renaissance, but brings this new Reformation emphasis to it as well. Max Weber made famous this, this last uh, element with his famous book, uh, The Protestant Work Ethic. All of this tended to produce a new interest in science and its utility. Philip Schaff, the famous uh, church historian, says the invention of the printing press prepared the way for popular education. The Reformation first utilized the press on a large scale and gave a powerful impulse to common schools. The genius of the Protestant of Protestantism favors the general diffusion of knowledge. It elevates the laity, emancipates private judgment stimulates the sense of personal responsibility. So those are all kind of Reformation emphases. Every man should be trained to a position of Christian freedom and self-government. And as Mr. Dowers was arguing on Wednesday, and I would thoroughly agree, it was that kind of atmosphere of the Renaissance combined with the Reformation that created, as he said metaphorically, the soil, out of which we find in the scientific revolution, which largely is uh, pro uh, taking place during the 1600s. J. Robert Oppenheimer, who was a, not a Christian, but an important phys physicist of the 20th century, said Christianity was necessary to give birth to modern science. Francis Bacon, certainly a major figure of the scientific revolution, made this comment, man by the fall at the same time fell from his state of innocence and from his dominion over nature. Both of these losses, however, can even in this life be in some part repaired. The former by religion and faith, the latter by arts and sciences. And again, you can see an expression of a, of a Christian view with respect to how science is performed. Francis Schaeffer said the early scientists believed that there is a reasonable God who created a reasonable universe that could be discovered by reasonable means. So the scientific revolution, I think you can argue with a straight face, is in many ways at least impelled by the philosophical ideas that were part of the um, uh, Reformation. But having grabbed that ball and started running with it, in a sense we just run it, you see. And so after the scientific revolution, we get a different moment in history that is commonly called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, in a sense, is saying, hey, science can do so much, we're not even so sure we need that idea of God anymore, you see. Science begins to take on a more profound role than probably the people who were central to the scientific revolution would have um, tolerated. So the great successes of science led to an even greater confidence in science, with a diminishing place for God and the supernatural. The Enlightenment, the term itself, meant an enlightened understanding that we can solve most of our problems and accomplish most of the things that we need to without relying on a kind of divine figure. So you know the theology of the uh, Enlightenment was either atheism or deism, either of which puts God way out there where he's not too relevant, you see. And we become much more the center of the universe than those who must the, uh, the, the architects of our own salvation. The Enlightenment generally stood for the idea that man is the solution to his own problems, that he's own, his own savior, God is either non-existent or irrelevant to the quest for human meaning and achievement. And thus the Enlightenment saw science cease to be so much a tool and it was exchanged more for science as a god. And the impact of this change affected all of subsequent philosophy. This is a little graphic that uh, was typical of what took place in the French Enlightenment, in which you see there a goddess, reason, crowned, that woman in the center of this picture, and she is the object of worship, because reason is now what's going to save us. We don't need supernatural beings, it's our own human intelligence that's going to carry us through into the dawning of a new age. 
Well, there was a philosopher that came along toward the turn of the 19th century who didn't like any of this. He considered himself a Christian, and he was worried. He was worried because he saw that what seemed to be happening in his estimation was that science, like a bunch of alligators, kept eating up things that had traditionally belonged to the metaphysical level. So it's like God himself is now being gobbled up by these scientific alligators. And it was feared, Kant feared, that it wouldn't be long before we would decide we just didn't need any of that at all. We didn't need God. We didn't need those transcendent truths, those metaphysical realities that Plato had been worried about, and that we could just simply rest on science. And he believed that if that ever happened, it would be doomsday for the human race. So he wrote a work in which he was trying to show reason has its limits. Science can only do so much. And that most famous work of his is entitled Critique of Pure Reason, in which he's trying to argue that there's only certain things that science and reason can do, and there are certain places that science and reason cannot go. And he wants to put in that place where science cannot go things that need to be kept safe. He wants to rescue God. Isn't it nice to know there's people out there rescuing God? So we should thank Kant for his generous efforts on behalf of the deity. This is the uh, most famous book that he wrote, The uh, Critique of Pure Reason. And it produced, Kant never used this term, but later philosophers did, it produced what came to be called Kant's Wall. So Kant's Wall has this very important kind of significance to it. The things that matter most are placed safely behind the wall, where science cannot eat them up, you see. So on the other side of the wall, you can't see them, you can't get at them by rational means, because the critique of pure reason showed that you couldn't, but on the other side, nevertheless safely, are those things that need to be kept out of the reach of science, which is nature, observation, experience, or what Kant called the phenomena. That's this side of the wall. On the other side, you have God, the human self, real beauty, real truth, goodness, the noumena. Just a little aside here, notice the human self is part of what's on the other side of the wall. The human self was the original interest of psychology. But of course, if you're a rat, then you're a machine. There is no self, you know. And that, I think Kant even saw that as the long-term effects of this enlightenment spirit. So he was trying to put even your own sense of self in a place where it wouldn't be attacked. So on this side, we have that which is known by science, truth. On the other side, is known by faith, and it creates then this brick wall where there used to be a line. The line implied that we could actually get to the other side. We could actually discover things that are up there by some sort of rational processes. The wall says you cannot get there from here. The noumenal world has the self, the God, the things in itself. The phenomenal world, this side of the wall, has science, reason, observation, and experience. And you cannot cross from one to the other by any ordinary means other than simply faith. You just take it by faith. You see. Well, subsequent philosophers had two responses to Kant's wall. There was, on the one hand, those philosophers that I like to call pessimistic because they believed that if that other side of the wall cannot be accessed by reason, then it must not really matter much. And so let's despair, let's be pessimistic about a noumenal order of reality, and let's simply build philosophy out of the concrete and mortar that we find on this side of the wall. And so you have a set of philosophers who do something like that. One of the first and most important was named Auguste Comte. Again, around the turn of the 19th century. And he gave us a philosophy that's called positivism. Positivism is concerned with what not why. Comte didn't want us to bother with trying to give explanations of things. He simply wanted descriptions. This, by the way, is probably the great inspiration behind someone like B.F. Skinner. He doesn't care about why a rat does certain things. He simply wants to note that it does certain things. And he feels the same way about you. The why of you doesn't matter much. 
fact, there probably isn't a why. There's just a what. And the what is those forces that have shaped you, you see, produced you. That's positivism. There's no questions that go beyond simply pure description. Another aspect of his thoughts, another contribution he made was called scientism. Not just science, where science is a tool by which we may in some ways discover the nature of God. Scientism says, in a sense, there is no God, and that science alone is our God. Science is our savior. Science is that which is going to ultimately save us. Pragmatism. That the measure of the worth of anything is not so much some kind of transcendent value, it's goodness, it's truth, it's beauty, but it's utility. Does it work? Is it something that we can use as an implement for human progress? All of that, for Comte, became the stuff of philosophy. No reference to the other side of the wall, you see. Now philosophy is preoccupied with what's on this side of the wall, and he's doing that precisely because of an overestimate of what science can do for us. That's the whole point that I want you to hopefully pull out of this. The other uh, kind of pessimistic philosophers, there's many, but I'm just mentioning a couple. William James, for example, uh, took the notion of pragmatism and really developed it into a full-orbed philosophy. Frederick Nietzsche similarly says there's no essence, there's just existence. And existence, again, is something purely on this side of the wall and others. The other set of philosophers that responded to Kant were what I call optimistic. They're optimistic in this sense, not that they think we can explore what's on the other side of the wall, but they do think that what's on the other side of the wall in some way or other breaks through, comes through the wall, and breaks through into our universe, our phenomenal world, in the ebb and flow of what we commonly call history. And so the 19th century tended to be preoccupied with notions about the nature and character of history. And all of the philosophers I'm going to talk about in the rest of the brief time we have together sort of have this historical focus. And they all started with the first guy that I mentioned earlier, George Hegel, Georg Hegel. He gives us what he called dialectical idealism. The word dialectic, as you know, means tension or conflict or debate or struggle. Idealism simply suggested that there is a great conflict of ideas, and in that conflict of ideas we see truth, which he called the absolute spirit, absolute ego, or reason. He said that this God, as he would, he might call this Hegel's God, was revealed in the dialectic of history. So the, the opposing forces that we see at work in history among great ideas gives us a glimpse from time to time of the character of God. So the way this works is you've got a great idea, a great thesis, which dominates people's thinking, but then is contradicted by some alternative idea which seems to be inconsistent with it, and the two could never be reconciled. Normally we think if one idea is postulated, and its opposite is also postulated, we can't have both be true, you know. We think if A is true, then not A cannot also be true. We think in those terms. Hegel said, no, no, no. No, actually, in some way they can both be true. So Hegel is considered the father of modern <coughs> relativism, because both A and not A are in some sense true, but we don't see it until the conflict between them produces a synthesis. And the thesis and the antithesis producing the synthesis is this engine of progress or evolution, which is the story of human life down through history. And it's as we look at this dialectical process that we catch a glimpse of this evolving God, who he calls an absolute spirit, but who is not absolute at all. Because absolutes don't change, but Hegel's God does, you see. And so the bedrock for truth becomes a shifting sand of a kind of relativistic approach to life and to understanding, and that's part of this whole dialectical approach. Well, the thesis becomes, or the, the, uh, the synthesis becomes a new thesis, and the, the uh, story goes on, you see, down through the ages, heading towards some kind of utopian goal. Other philosophers of the 19th century took that dialectical ball and ran with it. 
but they ran with it into their own particular interest area. So, for example, Karl Marx had a dialectical approach, but he didn't like the idealism of Hegel, and he called it rather dialectical materialism, in which the clash in history is not among ideas, but about, among material forces. So his Marxist triad was that there was a thesis, namely the rise of capital and wealth and owners and so on, and it's countered by an antithesis, namely the poor, the proletariat, the workers, and there's a middle class that gradually disappears, and you get this kind of polarized dialectic in history, and the two of them find themselves in conflict, and the conflict, of course, leads to revolution. And so the Marxist revolution is the engine of change. Change comes as we revolt, and as we find a kind of synthesis of these opposing ideas, which according to Marx will eventually usher forth the sort of utopian world of the brotherhood of all the workers of the world. We're still waiting for that to happen. Freud took the same idea, a kind of dialectical approach, but applied it in psychological terms. So for Freud, who likes to smoke cigars, by the way, and take cocaine, this is a different story. <laughs> Freud gave us his Freudian triad. You come into this world, the product of the evolutionary forces that have produced you, with id. Id is your animal instincts. You simply want things, and as a baby, you just reach out and grab them. You don't have any sense of conscience, any sense of propriety, any sense of social mores or norms. You're just driven by these animal instincts. But soon enough, by some kind of process of socialization, you begin to learn there's certain things you shouldn't do. It's not polite to point. It's not polite to stare. It's not polite to get cut in line. I mean, you learn all this stuff, and that informs the other side of this dialectic called the superego. And so in the Freudian uh, dialectical triad, you've got the id and the superego in a conflict, and they are constantly then issuing forth in a sort of synthesis or resolution of what he calls the ego. And it is an evolutionary process internally considered. And he, of course, thinks that if you go through a little psychotherapy, it'll help you facilitate this process. And so you should uh, always think about doing something like that. But nevertheless, Freud has a, a similar idea, as does Darwin. So you know that uh, Darwinian psych uh, uh, philosophy and biology was dialectical to its core. He again had a notion of a, you might call, Darwinian dialectic, in which you have a thesis, namely a species, which has been produced, and then by some kind of random mutation, there's going to be its antithesis, there's going to be an alternative species that's been modified to some degree, and these two then find themselves in a conflict. There is a struggle that is ongoing, and some process called natural selection is going to cause one to come out on top, but slightly modified. This is a process of species modification through dialectical struggle. And the entire point is that as this goes on over time, there is a gradual evolution toward increasingly complex and sophisticated expressions of species in this world. So the process goes, goes on in this kind of dialectical uh, system. And of course, all of this is driven by a sort of Hegelian outlook, and it uh, represents this kind of uh, uh, progress based on an evolutionary approach. Of course, Darwin's most famous book uh, reflects that idea in the title itself, The Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle. Read Dialectic of Life. You see, that there's a dialectical process that's driving species change in this world. So whether you're a Marxist or a Freudian or whatever, you have a similar notion of science now beginning to explain everything. You see, all explanations are coming by means of this. So my uh, concluding thought here for you is if Marx and Freud and Darwin or any of them are correct, then in fact you are in the Skinner box, you see. And that does fully explain who you are and what you are and you don't have any freedom and dignity and that's the difficulty that's, that's the, you know, the, the great thing about science, on the one thing, is that it ex explains so many things so well, and then there's some things that it cannot explain at all. And that's that delicate balance that I mentioned to you earlier, in which it is incumbent upon us, 
to re be those, as Paul says, who use this world but don't abuse it. We don't expect more from the tools of human uh, thought and so on that it is responsible to expect from it. And I'm uh, hoping that my little uh, presentation today, and I apologize for the technological problems I had there for a while, but I hope the general drift of it uh, has gotten over to you, and I hope it inspires you a bit, because my fondest hope would be that somebody in this room would be one who would take on the quest to rebuild a credible Christian metaphysic in a world which is despaired of metaphysics and left us kind of rummaging through the concrete and mortar that's simply on this side, or finding in some sort of superstitious view of history evidence of an evolutionary process that again really doesn't fully explain who we are. My hope is that, in fact, uh, you might be one who would take on the quest of doing what the psalmist did in the Psalms, only doing it in philosophy, demonstrating what the heavens declare the glory of God, and the earth shows his handiwork. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to you for your many mercies to us. We thank you for the great tools that are ours by virtue of science and all of its wonderful methods. We pray that you give us that modest recognition that there are limits and that there are some things we only know by the revelation that you have given to us through your scriptures, through your Son, and that taken together these give us the opportunity to really understand in many ways that which you're about. We thank you for the time we've had together now. We ask you continued blessing on the activities of the rest of this day and this week. Thanks for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.